Markheim. A play for radio by Tom Wright, based on a short story by Robert Louis Stevenson. The year, 1845. The time, Christmas. Markheim. It's Christmas Day. My shop is closed for business. My shop is closed, I tell you. Go away. Who are you? What do you want? Markheim. Who? Markheim. Let me in quickly. I tell you, I'm closed for business on Christmas Day. For ordinary business, perhaps. But when will you ever close for our kind of business? I do our kind of business at night. Has anyone seen you coming here? Not yet, but the streets will not be empty forever. Oh, you'd better come in. Has anyone followed you? Why should anyone follow me? Oh. Well, Mr. Markheim, your business must be urgent to make you behave so foolishly. It is... It is extremely urgent. <laughs> Even your tongue's reckless, Mr. Markheim. A bad failing in a man of business. And now that I know your business is pressing, you must not be surprised if I uh, profit by the information. <laughs> yeah, but then, Mr. Markheim, you've never been good at business. I suppose it's because you were once a gentleman. I, on the other hand, am a dealer. It's not the easiest way to become rich, but from time to time we get a windfall. Yeah, sometimes our customers are ignorant of the true value of the object they wish to sell. Then we touch a dividend from our superior knowledge. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they are dishonest. And in that case, I profit from my virtue. I do not, of course, suggest that your business is dishonest, uh, but we know that it is urgent. So urgent that you come to see me on Christmas Day when my shutters are up and I make a point of refusing business, when my maid is out and I'm alone in the house. Well, you'll have to pay for that, Mr. Markheim. I'm sorry if I interrupted your Christmas celebrations. I have thought of you so long as a dealer that I had forgotten you were also a man like other men. Go on with your Christmas celebrations... And a Merry Christmas No, you? no, no. <laughs> Christmas celebrations. No, it's not because you've interrupted my celebrations you must pay. It's for the loss of time when I should be balancing my books. You must pay for that. You'll also have to pay for a kind of manner I noticed in you today. When a customer cannot look me in the eye, he has to pay for it. <laughs> uh, now, uh, this object you've come to sell me, uh, uh, from your deceased uncle's collection, is it not? Uh, you are fortunate in having had a, an uncle who was a remarkable collector. I have exhausted my uncle's collection. Really, Mr. Markheim? Uh, so you've something else to sell me, uh, uh, no doubt from an equally reputable source. You're mistaken, Mr. Dealer. I have not come to sell. I have come to buy. To buy? Well, well, Mr. Markheim, I must, I see, congratulate you on a change of fortune. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, I've uh, had some rather fine pieces of china. Uh, this figure, perhaps? Uh, no, that would not suit my purpose. Uh, I need a present for a young lady. A young lady? Huh? Something small but expensive. <laughs> well, sir, so be it. We stand in a new relationship. I am, as I said, closed for ordinary business, but after all, you're an old business acquaintance and a man with a true feeling for objet d'art. Uh, now, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, ah, now, there is a fine present for a lady. A hand mirror. Uh, that glass is 15th century warranted. A glass? For Christmas? What do you mean by this? Why not a glass? You ask me why not. Look in it. Look at yourself. Do you like what you've seen? No? Well, neither do I, nor any man. <laughs> Your lady must be rather ill-favoured if you're afraid to give her a glass. I ask you for a Christmas present and you give me this. This damned reminder of years and sins and follies. This blasted hand conscience. What nonsense is this you're talking now? It is important to me, and it should be to you. I cannot think of my past without shame and cannot ignore it. I carry it with me wherever I go. 
Now, with one step, I can get money, free myself from it, and begin again. Your past is no concern of mine, and if you are concerned for your future, I advise you to take this glass. Why should we be in such a hurry? It is pleasant to get to know people. We should not hurry any pleasure. Not even such a mild one as this. I'm a busy man, Mr. Markham. I have no time for pleasure. Make time for it. Talk to me. Tell me about yourself. When we know each other, we might even be friends. I have no friends and need none. A dealer. A hand to get money and a safe to keep it in. Is that all you are? Dear God, man, is that all? Speak up, man, if you are a man. Is that all? I have only this to say to you. Either make your purchase or get out of my shop. Will you take the glass? Show me something else. Ah, This fan. Now, this dagger could reach to the hardest of hearts. Ah, a fan. An excellent present for a lady. <laughs> now, on second thoughts, a fan will not do. The ladies use them to cool themselves, to mask their faces and their emotions, as you use this mask of caring only for profit. No, the fan will not suit my purpose. Uh, perhaps this might suit your purpose. It's a fine piece. It will not heat your lady, but it will not cool her either. <laughs> and it has the added advantage that no moral lesson can be drawn from it. If... No moral lesson can be drawn from a cameo. Make me a present of one. Oh, well. Uh, no, no, no. I would not ask you to present me with anything that is a market value. Present me with a cameo of your life. My life? What is my life to you, Mr. Markheim? Less than nothing, Mr. Dealer. Our lives have crossed so often in the past. Always at some unfortunate moment in my career... We should not judge each other solely by such meetings. Such judgments as I make on people are purely and simply business judgments. How much you can cheat them off when you buy and how much you can cheat them off when you sell. You've been drinking, but that does not excuse your impertinence. You come to my shop, disturb me at my work on the pretext of purchasing a gift. Then you insult me, abuse me, charity, waste me time by talking nonsense. Nonsense? I have sunk very low in my life. But till now, the chief victim of my crimes has been myself. Now I have the chance to rise, to build a new and secure foundation and use the greatness that I know is in me. But to do this, I must make one last great plunge to find the means. And I must take another with me who will not share my rise. It is not a decision to be taken lightly, Mr. Dealer. I thought that you might help me to reach the right choice. But since you refuse, our association must end here. <laughs> oh, come, come, Mr. Markheim. Uh, you and I have dealt with each other for a number of years to our mutual satisfaction. <laughs> uh, let us forget these hard words we've exchanged and this fooling and attend to your business. Indeed. It is time to attend to my business. Time is my enemy. As for all your talk about dragging another person down or not share your eyes, Mr. Mark, I think you're being over-scrupulous. Scruples are a luxury that no man who hopes to rise in the world can afford. There are only two kinds of people, the users and the used. And now, uh, this might be the very thing. What are you doing? I prefer the dagger! <gasps> Is that death? Not grand. Not terrible. He looks like so much sawdust sprawled there. Smaller and even meaner than he was in life. Time has stopped for him, but it is more important to me than ever. <laughs> Time is my enemy. His money. Where does he keep it? It's not here. Where did you keep it, you old fool?
fool. The door at the back of the shop is open. He must have come from there and left it open. Open and waiting. Like an ambush. And who's there? Who, who could be there? My nerves are jumping like a hooked fish. Staircase. Three doors at the top. The money must be there. Where can it be? Someone on, on the stair. Is there anyone there? Can I be of any service to you? What? Who? Are, who you are I... looking for the dealer's money, I believe, Markheim. You know me. Indeed, I do. You have always been an impetuous man. I must say, you have excelled yourself today. Particularly in your carelessness. Carelessness? You should have come at night. The police are more vigilant at night. Besides, during the day, no one will notice me leaving. I shall look like all the others in the street. Will all the others be as noticeably stained with blood? Was it wise to use a dagger? There are less messy ways of killing. I used it because it was there, waiting for me. Was there any need to kill him at all? You could have bound and gagged him. Then he could have told the police my name. Oh, come, Markheim, would he have risked that? If he exposed you, quite certainly you would have exposed him as a receiver of stolen property. Why did you kill him? I didn't mean to. <laughs> I had no clear intention of any kind. I have been given a chance to make myself rich and break completely with my old life. All I needed was money. And that man had it, that dried up, loveless, joyless creature had it. I came here to get money, but I had no definite plans. You flatter yourself, you had no plan at all. You came without anything to bind him with or to kill him with. You have not provided yourself with an alibi. You wanted the dealer's money, but you did not know where to find it. On an impulse, you killed him. And now even he cannot tell you. And if you do not find the money, you have killed him for nothing, Markheim. I can tell you, but you must ask me first. I'm your friend. Accept my offer of assistance. I'll find it without your help. I do not think you will. Certainly you will not find it quickly. You need every second to make good your escape, and time is passing. Think how foolish it would be to have done what you have done and not reap the profit. I have paid too much already for it. I will not share it with you. I said I was your friend, not your accomplice. I ask nothing from you, and my offer puts you under no obligation. I want nothing from you. Then I will leave you. For the moment. Wait. Wait a moment. There's no one here. There never was. It was in your mind. Sounds of footsteps and... Being We're all in your mind. The, the last room. It must be there. The money must be there. Come in. What are you doing here? I was looking at the dealer's ledgers. You have balanced his books for him, Markheim, and his accounts are closed. Like a good clerk, you have put his affairs in order, and like an artist, you have coffined him in his final unchangeable definition. Dried up, joyless, loveless. A hand to get and a safe to hold. Those were your words, I think? If he had shown one sign that anyone would be the poorer or the sadder for his death, if he had even shown that he could find some pleasure in existence... You would not have killed him. But what of your need for money? In spite of that, I would not have killed him. <laughs> How convenient for you that he seemed to fit the formula that you made for him. Seem. What would you say if I told you he was not always as you saw him? He was not, of course, like you. You were born with every advantage. You do not know me. I do, Markheim. That is why I've helped you so often in the past. You? Help me? I have never seen you before. Who are you? 
I do not know if you are man or devil. What I am cannot affect the service I propose to render you. Oh, it can, it does. I do not know you, but there is something familiar about you. Something that haunts the dark corners of my mind. I feel that you are not of this earth and not of God. You cannot help me. I have helped you before. Without my knowledge. I will not knowingly be helped by you. Don't be a fool, Markheim. You have killed for money. I assure you that without my help, you cannot find it. I can and I will. <laughs> You're wasting time. Every second you waste brings it all nearer. The policeman's hand on your shoulder, the people staring at you as if you were mad, the jury weighing your life in the balance, the prosecutor etching your character in black and white, the judge, the judge with his black cap and his black hanging face, the prison, the gallows and the black coffin. Think of it, Markheim, the rope under your chin, the knot at the back of your neck, one jerk and your life is stopped like a clock. Where will your atonement be then? Where will be the great things that you meant to do, that you have always meant to do, swinging in the wind, Markheim? Swinging in the wind. Nothing. Do you accept my offer? No. You cannot terrify me into accepting it. I terrify you? Oh, come, Markheim, you terrify yourself. Fears are scuttling about your head like rats in a deserted attic. Sane fears, mad fears, fears of man, of devils, and of God. I have no fear of God. He at least will give me justice. I hope for your sake he tempers it with mercy. But before you face his justice, you may suffer at the hands of human justice. Unless you accept my help. What if someone has reported strange sounds from this house to the police? What if someone has informed against your friend the dealer and are on their way to arrest him as a receiver of stolen property? What if... What is it? Did you hear a sound from down there? What if he's not yet quite dead? What if he's dragging his bleeding body out into the street and crying, Murder! <laughs> Time was when the brains were out, the man was dead. You are a fiend. I am one who knows you and values you. No. You do not know me. Markheim, I know you to the soul. How can you know me? <laughs> not from my life. My life is a lie that grows and grows about me and strangles me. I am better than this disguise I wear. Can you not see that? All men are. You are too modest. All men are not Markheims. All men do not rob and murder and still have no fear of God. If my crimes are exceptional, so are my reasons. If I had time... I would prove it to you. To me? To you, more than anyone. Then you know me at last. Yes, I know you. But you are not what I expected. Did you expect me to exist? No, but if you did, I would have expected you to, to be intelligent. More than intelligent, godlike. Able to look deep into the souls of men, read what was there, and judge them truly to the marrow of the bones. Yet there you are, judging me by my actions like a policeman. Is that just? How did you judge the dealer? By looking into his soul? His soul? He had none. I did not take his life. He had no life to take. <laughs> are you laughing at me? Oh, Markheim, how fate has cheated you. There is a core of greatness in you, man. Let me preserve you for greater things. Oh, can you not see that we have nothing in common? I hate evil. I have never in my life sinned willingly. Very feelingly expressed, but I have no interest in such niceties of debate, and you have not time for them. Time is ticking you towards the gallows. Don't cover your ears. It will not stop because you cannot hear the clocks. Shall I help you? Shall I tell you where the money is? Your price is too high. I have not mentioned the price. I offer you the information as a Christmas present. If I were dying, 
I would somehow find the strength to refuse assistance from your hands. <laughs> the case is not hypothetical. You are dying, Markheim. This is the last room in the house. Search it thoroughly, Markheim. It will pass the remainder of your life. Without my help, you will never find the money. I will not commit myself to evil. If you only wish to save me so that I can spread evil, you should have saved the dealer. He would have been a better tool for your purpose. You underestimate yourself, Markheim. He had not your talent for self-deception, nor your sense of your own ultimate greatness, nor your interest in noble causes. There is no greater source of evil than a self-deceiving man. Unless perhaps it is a noble cause. There was a time when men were religious and the saintly butchers would set out to rob, torture, slaughter and lay waste the earth for their great causes. You must take up politics and butcher for a substitute for God, shall we say, the betterment of man. Then you can fulfill the whole promise of your life and still find the end you desire. Do you think I have no more hope for my life than to sin and sin and sin and in the end sneak into salvation? Is that all you know of man? Is murder so unholy that it leaves no trace of goodness in a man? Murder is no special category. All sins are murder, as all life is war. I have no interest in evil acts, only in evil men. It is not because you have killed a dealer that I offered to help you. It is because you are Markheim. Oh, no. If you discount my acts, you cannot say I am an evil man. Evil is strong and me, but so is good. I am pulled both ways. Must my vices always dictate my life? Surely the good in me can be a spring for action as well. Look, Markheim, you have been 35 years in this world. And your character has changed steadily throughout those years, always for the worse. Is that not true? No. I am the same as I always was. 20 years ago, you would have hesitated even to tell a lie. 15 years ago, you would not drink nor gamble. Rickery was anathema to you. Ten years ago, you would not have believed yourself capable of theft. Last year, the very thought of murder would have made you scream out in your sleep. Is there any crime you feel you could not now commit? If there is, name it. And within five years from now, I shall watch while you commit it. The long road you have come leads only down. Nothing but death can stop your descent. I know I have given in to evil, but so has every man. The very saints have sinned in order to exist. Answer me one simple question. Without treating your own conscience and from your answer, predict your own future. Do you hate yourself as you would once have hated a man like you? Or do you become more satisfied that you are a helpless victim of circumstances? Is the habit of evil your disguise, or is it you, Markheim? And you must content yourself with what you are, for you will never change. That being so, you must accept my offer. Take the profit of being Markheim with the loss. What of God's grace? Surely that is left to me. What have you done to deserve it? Or have you changed your mind? Will you sneak into heaven, snivelling your deathbed repentance? No, I will not. Then I will show you where the money is. No. You said you knew me to the soul, and now, because of you, I know myself to the soul. You have left me nowhere to hide from myself. I thought I might do some great thing and atone for my sins. Now I know that nothing can atone for what I have done. One thing I can do, though, and that is to find the strength to face poverty and starvation for the rest of my life. You have talked away the rest of your life. How are you going, Markheim, without the money? I'm going downstairs. Into the street with blood on your hands? Too late, Markheim. The dealer's servant has quarrelled with her sweetheart and left him. While we've been talking, she has been making her way home. While you were putting all your faith in divine justice, human justice has been coming for you. Pausing sometimes to weep a little or to look in shop windows, but it has been coming. Markheim, you need my help now, as you have never done before. Markheim! Markheim, it's the maid. What will you do now? No, you cannot do that. You cannot brush her aside and run past her. The street is full of people now. You spoke of bearing your misery for the rest of your life. 
The rest of your life depends on what you do now. You can think of nothing and do as I say. Go to the door with a serious face. Tell her you are a doctor. Her master has been taken seriously ill. She must go to him at once. When she is in the shop, close and bolt the door. Then, the same skill that rid you of the dealer will rid you of this last obstacle. Do this and you will need no help from me to find the money. You will have the whole day and night to ransack the house, find it and make your escape. I promise you suspicion will never fall on you. You will do great things and you will never need my help again. Look. At your feet. The dagger. Take it. Markheim, your life depends on it. My life. My dear, you had better go for the police. I have killed your master. Markheim by Robert Louis Stevenson was dramatized by Tom Wright. Markheim was played by Tom Watson, The Dealer by Martin Heller, and The Stranger by Malcolm Hayes. The play was produced in Scotland by Gordon Emsley.